We're good to go. Hi, everyone. Um, we're just, well, it's two minutes past, so I think we're going to begin. So I'm just sitting here next to Kalile. I'm going to run back to my office when she starts because she doesn't want me to sit here while she's doing the presentation. So um, thank you for joining the seminar today. We're having a presentation by Palile Mvula, who's a PhD student at UCT. Um, her title, the title of her presentation is Journey Through a Year in the Agullis Bank. Right. So I'll hand over to her and she's going to tell you a little bit more about herself. Um, so welcome again, please, as you join, make sure you're on mute and turn your videos off if you want to ask me a question, put it in the chat or raise your hand at the end of the presentation. Um, and yeah, I'll hand over to Pili and run back to my office. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, as Juliet runs back to her office, <laughs> we're getting started. So, uh, First, to introduce myself, I'm Pilile, as Juliet has said. I'm a PhD student with the University of Cape Town in the Oceanography Department. I became a part of the Oceanography Department through the Ocean Women Fellowship, which was a component of the Advancing Women Fellowship um, that was founded by the former VC with the purpose of creating an environment where women could um, drive especially in fields where there was a high dropout rate of women. And one of the benefits of the Ocean Women Fellowship was that we could, where possible, uh, have female supervisors. And that's where Juliet came in. She, was one, she is one of the Ocean Women PIs and my supervisor. Um, today, I'll be taking you through a journey through a year in the Gallus Bank with CTD data as our vehicle. And this work was done with um, Juliet as my main supervisor and with major inputs from uh, Professor Perry Sink, Michael Roberts, uh, Dr. Jenny Beach, and uh, Frank, Mr. Frank Gomshi. So as we all know uh, and understand, uh, most of us know, the, the Agalas Bank is a highly dynamic area, and this figure shows a cycle through this area. And one of the major reasons why the Agalas Bank is a highly dynamic area is its positioning. It's found uh, in the inshore region of a highly, um, a very fast, the fastest Western boundary current in the Southern Hemisphere, which is the Agalas current, which you can see here. Um, and because of its proximity to the Agalas current, it does get affected by the Agalas current uh, through, amongst other ways, the frictional interaction between the current and the bank, the bank topography, which can result in intrusion of cold water into the bank and also through expulsion of hot water from the current into the bank through things such as eddies. Um, the, the intrusion of both these um, different temperature water masses does result in a highly productive region. It has major benefits for the region. Here you can see um, the Eastern Akalas Bank, which extends from uh, 20 degrees, the Akalas Bank, which extends from 20 degrees east to 28 degrees um, east. And you can see that the Akalas current runs down here on the shelf edge. And right there on the shelf edge, you have a spawning area for Hake. And this spawning area benefits from the frictional interaction between the Akalas current and the shelf. Uh, but also, you have some spawning areas that are inshore. Uh, and these um, inshore spawning areas tend to benefit from a different yet amazing pro process that happens in the Akalas Bank, which is called uh, coastal upwelling. And the coastal upwelling is more due to strong winds that come from the east. When these winds come from the east, they cause war, um, they push the water masses on the exposed side of the bays here in shore, 
And as they push the surface water away, it allows for deep nutrient filled water to replace in that space. And uh, obviously the animals uh, or the organisms, when they see this water, they use it to its maximum capacity and you have high production inshore as well. And then you have this beautiful, um, highly productive region here as well, which is called the Cold Ridge. This is not a physical ridge, but rather a ridge that is uh, of differing temperatures to the adjacent water masses. And it also is a highly um, nutrient-filled area because it, although there is still studies that uh, con um, that don't agree on the main formations of it, but it also is seen more often when there is easterly winds. So we have some consensus of, on it being caused by upwelling as well. And then as we know, once there is a lot of productivity, exploitation tends to follow or rather consumption. Um, so the Agalas Bank also has fisheries in its region. We have the um, from the West, the Browns Bank um, fishing area, fishing grounds, which uh, they mostly are uh, intended towards deep water hake. And then you have in the central Agalas Bank where we saw the cold ridge, you have your um, blues banks. And then in the Eastern Agalas Bank where we saw the frictional interaction and also influence from coastal upwelling, we see the chalk line, um, the chalk line grounds. And the chalkline grounds, uh, an interesting thing about them is since they are on the shelf edge, they tend to be affected by obviously the, the availability of um, water, but also the fisheries processes on their own are very much affected by um, bathymetry. So there is, there has been over the decades, uh, fishermen saying when they are on the chalk line grounds, they troll up until they hit a feature, a rise, and then they have to pull out the, uh, the, the equipment because they cannot troll past this point. Um, then during a month long expedition, uh, ASAP expedition that was set to explore the secrets of the deep and correctly termed the deep secrets cruise, well, there was a, a ridge discovered in this area, which from the, re, the recollection of the fishermen, we would say it was already there, it just was waiting to be discovered. Um, and we had an opportunity to then work on this ridge because it is in a highly dynamic uh, area that is both highly productive and um, moderately to highly exploited. So we wanted to know are they, what is the physics around this ridge? And what is the influence of the physics on the organisms that live around this ridge? And that is the purpose of my study, the, the overall purpose of my study. The ridge is 40 kilometers across and 500 meters along. And it, it, the base of it is at 750 meters below ground rising up to 350 meters above ground at its highest point, so on its northern end. But why do we call it the Kinkley Bridge? Um, the reason why we called it the Kinkley Bridge is even though the Kinkley are no longer trolled uh, specifically, in the early days before the collapse around the 1980s, the, this was an area um, where King clip was, was collected or uh, exploited the most. And there were reports of more than 40,000 tons uh, collected or captured within a single uh, troll. So it led um, scientists to assume or to conclude that this might be where the king clip spawn, although we have not finalized where the king clip spawn, but it was one of the areas that we suggested. Um, and also this is an area where we, are, we do know for sure that they aggregate since they were able to be fished there um, in large quantities and also uh, follow up surveys ever since the exploitation um, and the collapse and the, the recovery have always found higher quantities in uh, that um, Charles 
tort line um, grounds area. So the first um, challenge we had into going into answering or doing this project was that during the cruise, this is what came out, which was a um, echo sounder image. We had a single beam, they had a single beam echo sounder image on board. And what had come out of it is transects across the feature, which means we did not have a 3D image of the feature itself. But these are also valuable because it, um, what you can see from them is in red, this is the feature. And then in blue, that is productivity, so plankton. Uh, and we, we can see that there is productivity on the surface. And when this was sampled, it was found to be corals. So there's corals on the surface, and that might be the reason why the fishermen called it chalk line, because if you would put a trolling instrument against a feature with corals, then it'll come out looking like you drew it with chalk. Um, and then you have all this productivity above it, which again says it's a productive area and we do need to look more into protecting it. Uh, we then proceeded to represent the figure in a 3D formation or in more of a complete picture to build a complete uh, picture of the feature. We use some uh, high quality bathymetry data to reproduce the feature using the coordinates uh, provided for us by Dr. Karisink, who led the expedition that uh, discovered the ridge. And we were able to confirm that indeed, it's at its highest point, it is it rises up to um, 350 meters. And at different points, it goes as low as um, around 750, which is recorded, but it, it perceives as below because when you look at it from the side of the shelf, it drops uh, with the shelf drop. So now that we know what the feature looks like, what are our object objectives, what do we wanna do? So we set out to determine the annual cycle of the Akalas bank at the surface and at bottom depths using the in-situ data and then determine whether the Akalas bank dynamics can be captured in a hydrodynamic model uh, using the in-situ data as validation, and then determine uh, whether the ridge has any influence on the productivity uh, using an individual base model with the individual being a king clip, having king clip lifestyle characteristics. Um, one may ask if we are going to go into models, then why not just jump straight into a model? Why do we even bother mining the satellite data, the in-situ data, I mean? Uh, it's because of our understanding that even though models provide uh, spatially and temporarily high resolution data, they are forced with in-situ data, which may be in the form of um, on-site observations or satellite observations. And that um, the, the in-situ observations are what we consider the true representation of the system, so the ground truth. And um, their spatial and temporal uh, resolution is, is a limitation to it, but it, since it is the truest form of what is going on in the system, it is very valuable. When it comes to satellite data, it only gives a, set, a surface view, which means it is limited uh, spatially. So once we uh, were able to get the data, um, this is what we had to go, I had to go through to get the data. So even though that I knew I would be using historical data, I wanted to um, get my hands dirty, get to working with the data uh, quite a bit from the initial source. Uh, which was uh, CTD sampling. This needed me to go to field, um, to cruises, to research cruises. And when I went there, I was introduced to a to different kinds of sampling methods for physical data, which can be bucket sample sampling, XPTs, and the CTD. The CTD for me seemed to have the most, the best, the better of quality of data. But what is a CTD? A CTD is a conductivity, temperature, and depth um, sensor. 
and what it is, it is a group of probes that um, capture these um, parameters. So you have a temperature sensor, you have a conductivity sensor, you have a pressure sen and a pressure sensor. And often when you ask anyone what a CTD is, they will say this that I'm holding onto in the image. That is not the CTD. The CTD is the little image here, which is a group of probes. And then it is attached to the rosette sampler. And as soon as it gets attached to the rosette sampler, the rosette sampler loses its name. So this is um, the different uh, sample methods that I was exposed to. <laughs> And it allowed me to then make an informed decision on which data I was going to use. And also it helped me in further processing the data because I knew the limitations of the data as from when I collected similar data in, in situ. When it comes to what data we have, we first have to look at when South Africa had the, the privilege or the opportunity to do offshore sampling. In, 1990, in 1977, um, South Africa declared an exclusive economic zone. This meant that we had this 200 meter, 200 nautical mile stretch of coastline where we now had to had the responsibility to take care of ourselves, which was good because also it meant we could limit or adjust the exploitation on it. So as soon as 1980 hit, we set out on being able to sample it for ourselves to know what is going on in this area that is ours. Uh, we started uh, with the Benguela Ecology Program, which focused on the western coast of South Africa. And then we, with the information we found there, there was a realization that there is species also in the, um, in the south coast, or at the time there was a belief that it's the same species for most of them that live between the south coast and the west coast. So we extended the programs onto the Akalas Bank or the south coast of South Africa. And uh, then in 1983, there was an initiation of the pelagic biomass surveys, and then followed by Spawner biomass surveys in 1984, then Damesel surveys in 1985, uh, with the pre recruit surveys starting in 1992, but dissipating like shortly after. Uh, the pre recruit surveys are now used to do any missing work. So if you want to do an explorative study, you are allowed to use the time that are scheduled for pre recruit surveys, but it's no longer a strict program. When I received the data, I first had to um, explore what it looks like, how far it extends. And on the right here, we have an image, a 3D image of the distribution of surveys. And from the depth, you can see that a lot of them do not um, explore the depths much. Um, and if you go back here on the distribution or the split, according to crews, um, the, the pelagic, excuse me, the pelagic biomass cruises uh, the bulk of the of the samples, followed by the spawn and biomass cruises, and then the um, the muscle cruises. That all three are meant to go to as far as eight hundred meters. However, when you explore the data, you notice that since they do not exceed the shelf, so they do not uh, tend to go past the shelf. They tend to go only as far as two hundred meters. Two hundred. 200, 250 at most. And then the ones that actually get to the, the depths, which is a demersal surveys, are only 8% of the total bulk of data. So that is already um, a challenge. So uh, knowing this, I went uh, further into the data. And um, since I wanted to create an annual cycle, I felt it best to separate the data into seasons. And my seasons are defined as the autumn, 
ranging from March to May, winter from June to August, um, spring from September to, to November, and then the summer from December to February. Once I had split the data into seasons, I then continued on to check for viability for interpolation. Um, and I, I set a cutoff at 50 observations. So if there was less than 50 observations, I wouldn't interpolate the data because the interpolation distance would be too large. And the interpolation I performed on the data was a critching interpolation, which is based on the distance between um, observations. It uses that as weighing to then predict the, the observations in between. The interpolated data, since it was not, it would it would be now spatially um, not patchy, was then uh, compared with satellite data. I then decided to set a criteria for what I would consider a successful computation of the annual cycle. On the surface, I would consider the, um, the autumn, I would consider the data viable if I see signs of surface cooling in the autumn um, and um, low su surface temperatures in the winter, surface heating in the spring, which would appear similar to the surface cooling in the autumn, and then high temperatures, the highest surface temperatures in the summer. Uh, that coincide with the coastal um, upwelling in the inshore region, so cooler in a cooler inshore region. Then in the zonal section, I expected a weak stratification of the water column uh, in the autumn and the spring months um, with deep mixing in the winter, so breaking of the stratification and strong stratification in the summer. So now that we have our criteria set, let's go into what we found. Um, the, the surface for the in-situ data was considered to be at 10 meters. This coincides with the level at which the satellite data captures its, its um, surface. So it allows for a one-to-one -one comparison. And what you can see just from these plots before interpolation, Already in the inshore area in the autumn, you see some patches of cool water with some intermediate water in terms of temperature in the mid shelf region, and then the hot water from the Agalas in the shelf region. And then moving on to the winter, you see a more homogeneous spread of temperatures with a very little extremes there and here. And then in the spring, again, you see a similar pattern to autumn where you have inshore patches of cold water, intermediate water, and then hot water in the, in the shelf. The summer as well, although it's more sparse, tends to have more, a little cool water in the inshore region, a, a warm middle region, and a hot um, outer region. What you also see from this spread is that there is no very limited, if any, samples that actually go past the shelf edge. So our samples, when it comes to depth, will be somewhat limited. When we interpolated the surface data, we found um, that, uh, again, the similar patterns are observed or preserved with uh, cool water inshore in the autumn um, spring and the summer months and more homogeneous water mass in the winter. Uh, what we see when we compare this to satellites is that there is an agreement in terms of general patterns or distributions of water masses. However, the, the satellite tends to perceive the inshore region as a slightly warmer than is um, found in the, in the in situ data. This is expected since some satellites tend to not pick up on the micro scale features in coastal regions. They don't have such great resolution in the coast. Um, there is also a slight um, underestimation of the current in the autumn and um, summer, uh, and it matches a bit better in the, in the winter and spring. 
Then we looked at zonal sections um, and you can see um, that they, as much as it's not well resolved here, but there is hot water at the surface uh, with a rapid change around 50 meters and then you get cool water, which can indicate a, uh, a slightly weak stratification. And in the winter, you see a break in the stratification with a more gradual uh, change in the temperature of the water. And um, as you move into the spring, again, you see similar patterns to the autumn where there is surface heating and then there is um, a weak stratification. In the summer, um, the, the, the hot water at the surface is visibly hotter than the water just below it. You can see the rapid change is even higher um, in the summer months. Uh, the interpolation allows us to visualize it a bit better with uh, a, a, a thermocline starting to be visible there in the summer, which is an indication of strong stratification where the surface cooling has resulted in much, much um, hotter water than the water just below it. Uh, what we can take from this is when we compa combine what we perceived at the surface and what we perceived at depth, um, there is a kind of a communication since it is the same system. When at surface um, you have high temperatures in the autumn of about 20 degrees Celsius at the shelf edge with the cooler um, temperatures as you approach the inshore region, you can see these high temperatures uh, even on your depth profile, but uh, due to the stratification around 10 meters, you start to, to see a rapid decline in the temperature of the water. And then as you move into the winter, your, your temperatures are more homogeneous and are lower than what was perceived in the, in the autumn. And they are around 16 to the upper end of 20 degrees Celsius. And this uniformity does extend to the depth with a more gradual change in temperature with increasing depth. And with this gradual, uh, this gradual change in temperature breaks the, the stratification and results in a much better mixed water column. And then going into your spring months, you uh, perceive similar patterns to your autumn, uh, where there is high temperatures at the top and a slightly rapid change in the temperature going down uh, to the depths. And then in the summer, you do have a high level of surface heating uh, just mm -hmm. due to the sun and then but the, the water underneath tends to be cool still. And then you have this difference in temperature of the water causing a very strong such stratification. When it comes to chlorophyll, um, important thing to note is that the chlorophyll is not collected in all of the different sampling um, types that um, uh, I presented earlier. So we have much, much less chlorophyll data. And when I went through this uh, with my criteria, which the first one was the samples have to be more than 50 observations to then perform an interpolation, I came to the conclusion that I cannot interpolate um, chlorophyll because it would be a stretch. It would be uh, more a very poor estimation. However, there is um, some patterns one is able to observe, but cannot say conclusively, which is in the inshore region here near Kabeha, which is in a bay, you have uh, higher levels of chlorophyll in, your, in the autumn months. And this is to be expected with when you see the, the temperatures decreasing because there was an indication of upwelling. And what upwelling does bring is uh, cold nutrient filled water onto the surface. Uh, so you're able to um, perceive higher chlorophyll there and then less and less as you go into the deep ocean. The same can be said more into the spring, but again, there's a 
high limitation in samples. Uh, the, the same pockets of chlorophyll there and there can be seen as you look through the water column. But again, um, I cannot conclusively say with the amount of data I've got. And then uh, chlorophyll-like temperature decreases with depth. So you have all the pockets of high chlorophyll are limited to at most 50 meters. So as we were doing our data mining, we also came across some current meter data that was derived from two current meters that were deployed in the central in the Eastern Agalas Bank in 1996. These were in situ current meters and they were left in the water between April 1996 to December 1996, which means they were in the water for nine months. And um, the just our luck, the one in the Eastern Agalas Bank was just above the, um, the Kinkler Bridge. Um, and so the, the blue um, current meter we we'll refer to as current meter one is the one that we consider to be in the central Agalas Bank since it is um, west of 24 degrees east. And then the one in green is in the Eastern Agalas Bank because uh, it is east of 24 degrees. Uh, the, the, the color in the current vectors is indicative of uh, current speed. So from these current meters, we then created uh, wind roses to perceive the, the dominant current direction throughout the year or throughout the nine months that the currents were in, in, in place. And for the one inside in the central Agalas Bank, there was more of a southeasterly uh, south direction, um, uh, predominantly throughout the nine months. And then for the current meter in the Eastern Agalas Bank, there was more of a easterly direction. When we looked at satellite data at these exact points, we found that indeed um, the, there is a, a southeasterly current in this area, but according from the satellite data, it was not the dominant one. Uh, the dominant one was more uh, southwesterly. And then in the Eastern Agalas Bank, there was a, a better agreement with the, the, the institute data where the satellite perceived uh, it's a north easterly, easterly current uh, dominance. Then we set out to expand it throughout the year uh, just to see which currents, um, which times of the year the currents are facing which direction. And the timeline here shows that where you, we have current that ranges from 50 meters to, uh, from 50 degrees to 350 degrees, but it is mostly um, found in the 100 degree to 150 degree range, which is um, the, in the southeasterly direction. And then at current meter position two, Again, we find our current is has a range of between 50 degrees to 350 degrees, but it is uh, mostly or predominantly found between the 50 and the 100 degree range, which is indicative of um, east to um, east to northeast. Then we thought to compare the, the current speeds. Um, the current speeds uh, were um, all ranged between zero and one. And when compared with satellites, we found that there was a, a strong correlation with the current meter that was found in the central Akaras Bank with a root mean square error of 0 0.3. Uh, whereas with the current meter found in the Eastern Akaras Bank, there was a moderate correlation of 0 0.5. Um, we do hope to, um, moving forward, uh, co compile or compare 
the cycles of the changes in current velocity with the cycles of current direction to see if the two coincide. So maybe when the current is moving fast, it is heading towards a change in direction, or if it's moving slower, then it's preparing to change direction. Um, but this is still a work in progress. Uh, moving on to the conclusions and challenges. So unfortunately, at the current, at the present moment, we cannot create a complete annual cycle from in-situ observations. There is not enough samples in the months outside the, the, the autumn and spring where the dedicated fisheries um, cruises happen. Uh, but the data is useful when it comes to fisheries monitoring, uh, but may become absolute with time as uh, shifts in life cycles have been observed in certain species due to effects of climate change. So there is a need to then expand the, um, the sampling spatially and temporarily. And what I would suggest with that is uh, making use of the prerequisite surveys because a vessel is already provided for those. If more samples can be taken then because it is a catch-all kind of cruise, maybe we can then um, increase the spatial coverage and the temporal coverage of our data. Thank you for your time. You may ask questions if you have any. Wonderful. Thank you, Palile. I'm sure everyone's clapping quietly in the background. Um, so I'm just looking, I'm not going to ask you any questions because that would just be mean. <laughs> um, so I'm just looking to see, I don't see any hands, hands up. Um, just a uh, wonderful in the chat. Anyone have any questions for Palile? While people are still thinking, I will just also mention that the next seminar is going to be on the 4th of May, and that's going to be James Blignot, um, who's a resource economist and a long-standing SAIL research associate, and his talk's going to be the economics of restoration in South Africa, looking back at the historic evidence while glancing forward. So that'll be on the 4th of May, um, so keep a lookout for emails from Caitlin. Um, I think I still, I don't see any questions. I think uh, it's really exciting work that Palile is doing. Um, it's never, you know, looking at the ridge hasn't really been done before. And it's certainly seen from the current meter data, some very exciting stuff where we would be expecting to see, you know, maybe the Gullis current featuring there in the current meter. And yet we've got a reverse reverse flow. Palile, has, has that kind of thing been seen in data before? Did you? You're mute. Okay. Um, oops, <laughs> never mind. Uh, yes, even though the average current direction has been captured in most studies to be in a south um, westerly direction following the direction of the current, uh, there has been um, studies that found the current going the opposite direction especially when there is an eddy in the region uh, because the, the, an eddy is a cyclonic feature. So it will change the direction of the water masses in that particular space while it is passing through. And since we do get quite um, a cycle of eddies in the Akalas Bank, we have started to perceive um, a change in the current direction more often. Thanks. So I'm very excited to see a bit more detail about that. We have Nkulileka has his hand up, but first of all, Brishan put in the chat. Great talk. Thank you. Just wanted to ask, how did you choose uh, the inter uh, interpolation method you used? Uh, I looked at a few methods, uh, but um, the, the cringing method seemed to be the most um, suitable for my data because my aim was to 
um, was to ensure, was to use a, an interpolation method that takes into account what I have, and then also considers the distance between the actual points that I have, not just, I have this point, I have this point to make an average. It weights it um, on the distance between the points. So if they're more sparsely spaced, um, the average changes as compared to when they are closely spaced, which then would give a better prediction of my environment than if I just averaged across with no consideration of the distance between observations. So yeah, the creating method seemed to be the best for me. Great, Prishan says, thank you. And Kululeka, your hand was up, but now it's not up anymore. Well, thanks, Juliet. I, I thought you recognized me, so I was just waiting for it. <laughs> Um, I was hoping to ask a question while Pilile's slides are still up. I don't know if she can still show a bit. There's a figure that I um, I like to check something small on. It's what it's the figure just before your your conclusion. This one. This one, yes, exactly. Um, I was just wondering about um, the bottom, the lower figure. You see, on the lower figure, you're having current velocities of zero, especially since 1996 till 1997. Um, is there something not worthy about that? What do you say about all of the data? Um, so I I had made this graph and then I also noticed what you noticed. So I went back and actually take check the minimum values and the minimum values were 0 0.15. So it's a matter of scale. They are not zero. It's just, they are very, very small in the grander scheme of between zero to 1.4. Oh. Oh, that, that's wonderful. But what can be concluded from it, uh, given that it is precisely happening within the period of, of a year in your data set, if there's anything you've pondered about it? Now I'm pondering about it. Uh, I will look into it. Uh, there was quite, um, this was a quite a busy time in the, in the Agalas Bank. Uh, we had uh, Agalas Nino, that's what this referred to, uh, hence why the, uh, the, the current meters were put in place to start with, because there was investigations being done. Uh, I will have a further look at the data and um, find out why, if this has any implications on what was occurring at the time. But as of right now, I cannot tell you for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Nkululeka. Yeah, really looking forward to seeing what Palile gets out of this current data. So that's a great question and uh, we're excited to see. Um, so I see Eckhart has put in the chat, I wonder if you in have included wind mixing effects with seasonal variations and the consequent establishment of thermoclines and more uniform water columns. I think it's it's a it's a good comment and Polina needs to take a copy of it and ponder some over that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh it's definitely something to to consider. Um I don't know, Polina, if you want to say anything more. I will consider it. <laughs> I'll right. definitely consider it, especially when we go into when we go into um forcing the model. These are things that are going to be have to have to be considered from all aspects. We cannot just use the movement of the ocean to justify the movement of our particle. We also have to consider wind uh, action and wave action. So there will be more investigations done and um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so we need to get a copy of the chat. And then Brishan just asks about what satellites you used and which software or programming languages did you use to process all your data? Um, so the satellite data was from the Astia uh, satellite and um, the Astia data set, I mean, and the software, the programming language I used, Python. Great. And then there's a thank you. This is really cool stuff. Um, so I think on that note, that grilling of Pilile, we will... Um, wrap up I don't see any more hands or any more 
chat questions in the chat. So thank you again, Lile. That was really, really excellent and informative. And we'll see you all on the 4th of May for James's talk. Thank you everyone for making the time. Bye.